And this is Council President Tony Troutner. This is a remote meeting due to the COVID-19 coronavirus emer emergency. So welcome to anyone that is watching us live on TV21, on the City of Kent Facebook page, or the Kent TV21 YouTube channel. And then you are also welcome to dial in and listen to this meeting as well. So welcome to everyone that's joining us today. We do have a full agenda, so let's get started. Kim, would you please call the roll? Council President Troutner? Here. Council Member Boyce? Here. Council Member Fincher? Here. Council Member Core? Here. Council Member Larmer? Here. Council Member Michaud? Here. Council Member Thomas? Here. And I've noted that the mayor is also in attendance today. Thank you. Great. Thank you, everyone. Are there any changes to the agenda from council or staff? No changes this afternoon. All right, then let's get going with our department presentations. And we will start with the first one, which is small business emergency grant update from Bill Ellis. Welcome, Bill. Thank you, uh, council president. Thank you, council members. Uh, I have an update. Um, a short one on the small business emergency relief grant I've been working on with my colleague Michelle Wilmont. Uh, first slide, please. Um, so just revisiting the eligibility criteria, uh, we relaxed them a couple of weeks ago and uh, extended. Uh, the application period is now closed. Next slide, please. Uh, so where are we in the work stream? Um, so we are now, we have uh, agreed to Craft 3's competitive evaluative uh, scoring. Uh, those businesses that have identified themselves from historically underrepresented groups are receiving priority in scoring. Uh, those businesses who uh, show household income as lower uh, or those businesses that have received no other aid prior uh, to uh, this grant are receiving prioritization in points. Uh, and those who have experienced outsized COVID-19 impacts on operations, those who've had to uh, be shuttered uh, more fully than other types of businesses are also receiving additional points. The points and the, the, the purpose of our, our, our scoring uh, system uh, will be one to uh, triage relief. Uh, this will be a competitive grant um, and the goal is to uh, triage that. There will be more uh, needy businesses than there will be uh, funding available. Um, August 17th is when both uh, declination letters and award letters will be sent. Uh, we're in a period now where um, uh, finance department is making some compliance checks and then craft three will do additional compliance checks as well as uh, doing the evaluative scoring themselves uh, and making the direct disbursements. They will also be making the declination and award notifications. Uh, craft three uh, would remind us that at this period, um, it is good practice, best practice of the competitive grant program uh, not to change uh, applications after the fact, after the application is closed to get people back into compliance. All I will say though, uh, both our finance department and uh, ECD uh, staff have worked uh, very hard to uh, accept as many business licenses up until uh, the deadline as possible uh, to uh, make more businesses eligible. There was a large number of businesses who applied who prior to this either did not know they needed a business license or uh, for whatever reason had not uh, filed one previously. Uh, and so that was the major correction to get people eligible for application. Uh, then after August 17th, uh, week. Uh, oh, no, that's right. Next slide, please, Kim. Uh, so uh, thanks again, uh, as I thank every week to our community helpers. Uh, we've received uh, 539 unique applications uh, as of the closing on Sunday. Uh, nearly 100 of the applicants uh, took the extra step to indicate that they had received technical assistance from uh, likely one of the uh, organizations or some of the people who helped us who were unaffiliated like interpreters uh, with an organization uh, on the right there. The top listed sources of referrals to the grant program by the businesses was the City of Kent's own direct communication, uh, secondly, uh, the World Relief, Kent Downtown Partnership, uh, uh, Somali Interpreter Ismail Mohammed, uh, the Kent Reporter, Child Care Resources, Community Lab, Kent Station, Kent Chamber of Commerce, and the Iraqi Community Center. 
Uh, we'll have more numbers to report as compliance checks refine lists by eligibility. Um, and uh, we'll have more demographic information and more compliance information as time goes on. Next slide, please. With that, I just pause for questions on the small business grant update. Great, thank you, Bill, for that update. Do you have any questions or comments on what you've seen today? Councilmember Boyce. Will we receive a final report from the council on who received and dollar amount type of thing after everything is done, Bill? Yes, of course. Uh, so uh, we have one and a half million dollars uh, that have gone uh, towards granting. Uh, we're doing 217 businesses roughly will be awarded at a dollar amounts of 6,500 per. We have spent additional money, of course, for technical assistance and language interpretive services also out of the CARES Act. Uh, we are still in the process of checking what we've received on Sunday, and uh, I will be able to make a fuller report after the evaluative scoring period has taken place. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Fincher, do you have a question? Yes, thank you. Bill, do you have an approximate number of uh, or the number of businesses that did not have a license but have applied and been issued a license? Uh, at least 10 percent. That's an approximate at this point. You think? Any other questions for Bill? Great. Bill, thank you so much for keeping us updated on this process. We appreciate it. Thank you. All right, I am going to welcome Michelle Wilmot. It looks like, Michelle, you've got a couple presentations. Let's start with the Kent Valley Branding Update. Yes, uh, good afternoon, council members, Mayor Ralph. I am excited to um, give you this quick update on a couple of our key branding initiatives. Um, the first being our economic development website, which is at kentvalleywa.com. If folks in the audience have not visited this site, I encourage you to do so. Um, just by the way of background, this site um, is one example of a collaborative, um, a collaborative effort that Bill and I are working on um, with our counterparts in our neighboring cities. And what this site does is it really zeroes in on what makes our region unique and distinctive as a global aerospace and advanced manufacturing hub. Um, that is what we're really trying to sell when we are um, working on recruiting different businesses to come to our area, not to the exclusion of others, but this is, this is just a key factor that makes Kent unique and distinctive. Um, we know that when we're looking um, uh, to an aerospace or outer space company, for that matter, from across the country, that our region collectively is much stronger together with, um, with our specialized workforce, um, of this continuing legacy of innovation. There's amazing companies um, just to our north in Tequila doing satellites. Of course, Blue Origin is doing rocket ships. And then of course, uh, the myriad of suppliers um, all across Kent Valley. Um, so you can see that this partnership um, is really valuable when when it comes to talking to these companies, we want them to come to our region. Um, that is really the competition. Um, competition amongst our neighbors, um, rather, is not really where we're focused on. What we want to do is recruit companies to come to our region and not go to other states like Texas or Colorado, for example. Um, if, you're, if you go to the site, um, you'll see that it has some really great um, information about um, different stats um, in the region, um, different stats about the makeup of Kent Valley's 10,000 plus companies and our 252,000 employees, the industries they're in, be it aerospace, outer space, advanced manufacturing, global trade, food manufacturing, and the like. Um, the information that we've included on this site um, is, 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 what our site selectors tell us that they want and what they expect to find when they are researching potential sites for either locating a new business or expanding their operations or relocating altogether. So this is very much based on what we are told that site selectors want to see. Um, the site also includes um, a business directory, and it's you'll see that there. Um, it, it does include 
certain um, industrial and manufacturing categories. It doesn't include all businesses in Kent. It doesn't include restaurants um, or service industry um, types of businesses, but um, this is certainly the, the certain categories of companies that we are trying to um, recruit via this website. Um, it's helpful um, having uh, business directories are helpful for um, potential recruitees because it helps them to know who they might be able to collaborate with or compete with for that matter, or where their employee spouses might also find jobs should they choose to locate in the Kent Valley. There's also a really great um, available real estate tool and it works just like those of us who might be, you know, looking at uh, different houses on Zillow or Redfin, um, using this tool, um, our real estate tool, a site selector can put in the required amenities for their, for their space, and they can be shown a list of properties that meet those needs. Um, so this is something that we didn't have before. It really put us at a disadvantage when people were looking um, at Kent Valley's amenities. Um, but we've, we've come full circle and we now offer all of the components that site selectors tell us they like. Um, finally, the site includes a calendar of regional business events and the latest news section and links to various industry partners and their contact details there. So you can see the collaborative spirit that um, is inherent in the many relationships we've developed over the last couple of years when Bill and I have been working together. Uh, but moving on from this webpage, we, we love this website and I hope you will take a look at it if you haven't already. Um, building a site without getting web traffic is useless and frankly, a waste of time without search engine optimization. Um, this is something that I have learned a lot about in the last few months. Um, we thought that our website was search engine optimized, which means, you know, people put keywords in and what have you, but there's much more to it than that. And we have tackled this. Um, we've tackled this uh, with uh, using a gentleman who is an expert in search engine optimization. Um, that is the process of increasing visibility for those who Google, who Google us. So the whole point is, is when somebody Googles advanced manufacturing and you'll see on the site that um, on the slide there that I have um, included Kent Valley um, advanced manufacturing actually comes up in first position, um, which is a huge success. We launched the site last fall and it wasn't until April where we really dialed in our SEO efforts. And now we're starting to see some of the results of them. Um, our web traffic via Google has increased 58% since then. And where before it was just at 16%. And where this is just super important is because Google, as you can, you've all probably tried using, is the most trusted channel and best way to be found by those who don't know that you're out there on the internet already. Um, there's a ton more technical information I can share, but um, the point is, is that we're really um, working to grow traffic to the site. And we're really working to um, ensure Kent Valley's placement is above the fold, which means like the first five categories when you do a Google search. Um, but I cannot move on without telling you something, this exciting tidbit. When I mentioned uh, keywords just a little bit ago, there is value to those keywords and some have more value than others. Um, apparently last in April, the value of the keywords that we had pre-selected on our site was just $154 a month. And now that that is ranked at over $2,100 a month, meaning we've seen about a 475% increase in our keyword rankings. And this was all very confusing to me, but the best way to explain it is if we had to pay for this ranking via AdWords, meaning we wanna to pay to show up on a website, we'd have to pay $2,100 a month to get the same traffic volume based on the keywords that we're selecting. So as you can see, 
it matters. And this, this work is really incredibly important, especially now given we've had to reduce some of our other advertising um, budgets and um, we're, we're left to our own devices to be super scrappy and making sure that people are aware that Kent Valley exists and that um, we've got a website where people can gather a lot of great information about it. Um, interestingly enough, and I'll leave it at, the, at this on, on, the, um, on the website and the SEO, the same tool that we used to be able to share with you these rankings is called a web grader. And how it does is it, it looks at the value of these words and how much traffic you're getting. And when we did a comparison of what the Kent Valley site is doing compared to our Greater Seattle Partners website, um, interestingly enough, the value of their site is zero. Um, on one hand, Bill and I were doing big high fives for us being scrappy and resourceful. <laughs> but on the other hand, it's not helpful for our state's international uh, business recruitment efforts. And we're actually planning to share these findings with them so they can address it. But for us, we were pleased that we are finally starting to see some really excellent traction on, on um, our efforts with this site. Uh, changing gears, um, you know that COVID's forced us to cancel um, our, our lodging tax grant program for this year due to, um, due to drastically reduced revenues. But thanks to our partners with better capitalized lodging tax funds, we're referring many of our applicants to our neighboring cities for consideration. Um, one event, which I'm super excited to tell you guys about, one of our applicants who we actually were under contract with before COVID hit is um, women in manufacturing. They had come to us to bring their, uh, to bring their um, regional um, conference to Kent. Women in Manufacturing is a national association that um, supports and promotes women pursuing careers in the manufacturing industry. And they've got more than 4,000 members and represent nearly 1,000 manufacturing companies. And that includes people from production um, positions clear to um, the C-suite. And we um, were thrilled to award them a grant to bring their regional conference to Kent this fall. But due to um, all the uncertainties with COVID, they've moved to 100% virtual and they will hold their conference April 28th through the 29th. And Bill and I have been so impressed with them and their plans to provide tremendous value to us as a sponsor. Um, with what they come up with, I hope that you all agree that the value far exceeds the Lodging Tax Committee's investment. We're actually getting a, um, a three for one bonus where they're, they're elevating Kent's promise prominence in, in um, the manufacturing sphere when it comes to these different conferences. With this conference, we are a gold sponsor for this fall's regional um, event. Um, by default, we'll also be among sponsors with the Association of Washington, Washington Businesses Manufacturing Bus Tour, and that will happen during Man National Manufacturing Week. And finally, they will include us as a gold sponsor in their national conference this spring, which they plan to bring to the Seattle area. Uh, they haven't determined a location yet, and they'd love to do it in person. Obviously, we have to wait and see what happens with um, the results of, of COVID and a vaccine and what have you. But nevertheless, they're providing some tremendous value for us. And I'll just leave you with a few highlights here. Um, they had planned to do in-person tours of various manufacturing facilities in Kent, but because that is not advisable at this time, they're bringing in a professional videographer to build videos for Kent manufacturing companies. And this is really great for us since we've had difficulty getting clips from companies due to brand guidelines, privacy issues, et cetera. Um, it's easier for a manufacturing peer to go ask another manufacturing company to participate by creating these videos rather than us as a city pursuing them. Although we have had some luck 
doing that. But these videos will be um, available for us to use on our own website, on social media, as well as the companies themselves. They'll be featured on the Women in Manufacturing um, Group's website, AWB, and Kent will be named a sponsor for all of these. So the value of this has a shelf life um, much longer than the actual conference itself. We think it's just a phenomenal benefit for us. I already mentioned the National Manufacturing Bus uh, National Manufacturing Week and the AWB's bus tour. Um, the AWB and the governor's office typically do a lot of media around this event, so Kent will be prom uh, prominently featured here during this video-only bus tour. While it won't be full of a bunch of people as um, typical, um, the videos um, of Kent manufacturing companies will certainly be featured in different uh, news outlets. Uh, the other um, thing I wanted to let you know about, which was also a great way to um, promote Kent companies too, is they are looking to do gift boxes to the first 100 attendees. They expect to have 200 people attend this event virtually, but they are looking to feature Kent company products um, as a gift box for the first folks that register. And what they're looking to do is include um, cookbooks from Macrina Bakery, charcuterie kits from uh, Salumi, and coffee from Starbucks, gluten-free pastas from Manini's. It, it's all great items that certainly elevates um, gifts beyond the typical notepads and pens and paper clips that we get when we attend these things. But it's going to be a really great way to feature Kent, um, Kent made products. That's one of the things I thought was pretty exciting. Um, they'll also host this conference while virtually they're going to host their leadership team on video, on camera, at a Kent hotel. So you can imagine while most of this conference is virtual, they will show um, the hosts and the leadership team from Women in Manufacturing. I can imagine it being coming to you live from, from the Hampton Inn in Kent, Washington, et cetera. Um, so it will definitely be um, um, noted that Kent is the place where this is happening. Certainly, our elected officials, including Mayor Ralph and any of you on the council, are welcome to attend and participate as well. They've got a lineup of great speakers and all sorts of different industry topics, but we were just pleased to see such a great pivot and such tremendous value being given to us as, as uh, prime sponsors for this event, even though it's looking a bit different than it would have otherwise. Um, we believe that WIM, Women in Manufacturing, is a substantial um, organization and really um, underscores Kent's brand that we wanted to really highlight as a great place for manufacturers to do business. Um, so we were just thrilled with this, um, with these benefits outlined, and um, I'll keep you all posted as more things come together, but that's what they've got um, um, solidified for us to date. And with that, I am happy to take your questions if you have any. Thank you so much, Michelle. Two really great presentations that continue to highlight all the good things that we are doing here in Kent. And I apologize, Councilmember Larmer, you've had your hand up for some time. Um, do you have a question or comment? I'm guessing maybe on the um, branding update. Yeah, actually, that's what it was. So Michelle, I wanted to tell you that while we were talking about the branding update, I had my dual screens going. And I put advanced manufacturing real estate into Google and Kent, KentValleyWa.com came in second and third. We love to be in the top five. Yeah, so keep that's working. Like, that's, <laughs> I'm going to so keep, work, that keep is working huge. on it. Yeah, and we're second only to an Ernst & Young white paper. So it's not even a competing um, real estate article. So yeah, I'm really impressed. And I just wanted to say really good job on that SEO. Um, Thank you. That's huge. That's pretty much, yeah, compared to what you would pay for ad for ad space. That's, that's giant. So excellent job. Thank you. I have to agree. Great comment. Any um, comments or questions for Michelle on either one of these presentations? All 
right? I'm not seeing any hands raised. Thank you again, Michelle. Um, you continue to share really cool things happening with us and I appreciate um, all the time that you took to put that together. My pleasure. All right, moving down in our presentations, I am going to welcome back Bill Ellis. He's going to talk about um, Andaden Avenue um, RFQ or request for qualifications. And then Bill, you're up um, a couple of times here. So if we can maybe at the end of this one have some time for questions before we move on, that'd be great. Absolutely. And uh, sorry for the filibustering today, just a lot going on and uh, wanted to speak to a few other things that we've been doing all along uh, through the course of the year. Um, actually, the thing I'm about to present on uh, this uh, afternoon, the request for qualifications in North Need and was something I, I thought we would have worked planned to have uh, launched maybe back in March, <laughs> but uh, uh, World Events had other plans for our year. Um, first slide, please. Um, so I just want to revisit for a moment uh, some of the ways that the city of Kent has used surplus property or participated in public-private partnerships to um, realize its vision. We've uh, worked, of course, to bring the Excessive Shower Center and Kent Station to our downtown. Next slide, please. Uh, we have worked both at the Grandview Apartments, but most uh, recently at the uh, golf course uh, uh, site uh, Ethos. We have welcomed thousands of new uh, units on the uh, dozens and dozens of acres on City of Kent property. Next uh, slide, please. The thing that we haven't done uh, yet is actually uh, use property as a means to bring work. Um, so we've, we've, we're, we've worked the entertainment angle, we've worked uh, the residential angle, um, but on the commercial angle to our primary industries that we have, uh, we haven't uh, dedicated property to work on that. And uh, you have a couple images here of people working in Kent uh, with the Aerospace Joint Apprenticeship Committee. Next slide, please. So um, I want to talk about the location of Naden Avenue property. It's uh, between State Route 167, State Route 516, uh, the UP, I'm sorry, the BNSF uh, rail line, uh, the PSE substation, and the interurban trail, which goes through our industrial valley. That's on three of the sides. On the northern side, it faces on our historic uh, commercial Main Street. So I think there's a good argument to be made that naturally this location, um, right at the 50 yard line of the Kent Valley uh, that Michelle was just talking about, uh, all the branding and site selection work that we've been doing for a period of time, um, sits prominently as a place for uh, commercial and specifically industrial development. Um, so uh, this few, just a couple of key facts, I think people know. Uh, the southern portion, two acres of the 7.69 is uh, currently uh, in a purchase and sale uh, uh, controlled by Braintree Development. I'll come to that at the end of my presentation. But the northern 5.72 is unspoken for. Uh, currently, if we valued it the same price per uh, square foot for that land as the hotel site, its value would be 6.9 million. Uh, our, our plan from an infrastructure point of view uh, is to vacate Old Naden, but then ask for any future development on the north half to uh, deed back property for a new road going along the eastern spine of the site. Um, so I think there's an opportunity here to look at this as an asset, considering the economic troubles that we're in uh, and the opportunities that we have uh, uh, to position this property to act on those opportunities. Next slide, uh, slide please. So what's the context in which we would be pushing forward a request for qualifications? Well, I've been talking uh, quite a bit over months now um, about the economic uncertainty that we've all faced um, and some of the facts and figures are in. Uh, Seattle metro area lost $13.5 billion uh, due to COVID-19 so far. Uh, annualized, that would be $26 billion in lost wages in Kingston, Homish, and Pierce County. Uh, we have an unemployment rate over 14.5%. We've lost nearly a billion dollars in taxable retail sales. Uh, retail and office as a speculative venture um, remains depressed. They were both difficult in South King County beforehand, so those would be unlikely to be realized. Um, amazingly, uh, industrial speculative development continues uh, to be elevated, uh, mostly because of the, uh, logistics demands on e-commerce. I'm not saying that there's a very large surge of manufacturing happening, although there is some onshoring and we do see site selections for no novel coronavirus antibodies manufacturing and vaccine manufacturing on the regular now. 
Um, and that will likely be a continuing uh, opportunity in the future. But most of the reason why uh, industrial speculative development is proceeding is on the basis of uh, logistics and people shopping from home. Um, and the other opportunity to note, and I think is really important to uh, why we feel uh, it's good to pick back up the plan that we had put down in March, um, is that there's record levels of federal government capital available for catalytic economic development projects. Uh, I have um, been invited to and am having conversations with a number of entities around it, uh, economic development administration grants uh, that could be paid for uh, either equipment as a form of capital uh, for let's say workforce training or business development. Uh, it could also pay for facilities, uh, buildings, uh, aspects of buildings, utilities, other things of that nature. And there's just record setting investment by the federal government into that uh, cabinet agency. And uh, recognizing that opportunity, I think it's important to help position the property to get uh, a development team as a partner on board with the city of Kent to pursue those opportunities realistically. Next slide, please. So the approach to North Eden Avenue um, that we would be pursuing uh, in the next few weeks would be uh, posting the request for qualifications, which exists in draft form now and would be finished in formatting by August 18th for posting um, and circulation. The, the, the purpose of uh, request for qualifications is, I would suggest, somewhat akin to a job interview. Rather than, let's say, with the hotel development, we, we were seeking a developer to produce a very narrow uh, project, what we we're actually seeking and, and then judging the proposal and the project and the pricing. Uh, what we'd be doing here is we're looking for a development team partner, first and foremost, and their qualifications. Then, once selected, uh, we would be jointly exploring uh, the program of the site, how best to phase development on the site, what tenants made sense and in what order, what would be their ability to pay, uh, what would there be their ability to achieve uh, as uh, tenants at this location, public benefit, and that would be our highest priority, would be the public benefits in terms of not just jobs and the activity near downtown, um, but typically, since we're in a recessionary environment, uh, uh, there's a greater demand uh, for capacity for workforce development services that uh, um, try to offer solutions to uh, job training. That's a very unusual situation right now with a lot of remote learning, um, but we're exploring that with a variety of partners. Um, and uh, there's also the idea that uh, with air commercial aerospace uh, so severely depressed, um, there has been a lot of discussion amongst those in uh, sort of economic development policy circles and, and trade industry associations about looking to what are some of the growth industries of the future that could help pull uh, parts of our economy back into um, profitability or could help uh, spur additional growth and jobs. And a lot of discussion around space, uh, which has been sort of recessionary proof in this period especially with the, not just the commercial new space race heating up, but the competition between countries uh, for ex, um, superiority of capabilities in space. So assets that would support those things are also very much uh, top of mind as terms of program. The developer in this case would be looking to uh, be a partner to the city and realizing its public goals, its assets, the things that it wants to achieve uh, that are uh, timely and strategic to the trends that are happening right now, the pricing of the land would be residual. So uh, we would, we're not leading with, this is the price per square foot, make it or break it, tell us your proposal exactly what it looks like. We'd be actually interviewing a, a developer and team to work with us to help cost out for those um, partners, allies, others in the region, uh, universities, colleges, workforce training agents and, and costing out realistically what it would take and when it could be given to them a, a location for them to operate. And then on top of that would be any other employment or um, uh, manufacturing that would like to or could be accommodated at such a site. Next slide, please. Uh, so I, I promised an update on South Naden Avenue. Um, so the purchase and sale agreement is not closed. Uh, we are in development agreement negotiations. Um, as Michelle mentioned, uh, it's been a very hard time for hospitality. Um, Seattle metropolitan uh, area's occupancy rate has averaged since March 10%. Uh, 
Uh, we've lost as a region 85,000 jobs in hotel and hotel supporting industry. Um, so it's made sense that our uh, 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 development partners at Braintree Development uh, have had to pause or delay um, some aspects of the rendering that you see above here. Um, this is a rendering of what Braintree Development was uh, is working towards at the uh, Kent site, at the Kent location. Um, this, this deal is not by any means done. Uh, I would say that the development team is continuing to work with our engineering folks and with their engineer uh, to cost out the location. Um, they think that the site location uh, makes sense from a market standpoint. I think there's still things to be done in terms of costing the infrastructure relative to the value of a hotel as an asset, especially at this time. Um, but uh, at this time, it's, it's made the most sense to extend uh, the deadline. So um, actually, can you just go back one slide, Kim? To revisit what we're doing a little bit differently here, um, we'd, be ask, we'd be asking for requests for qualifications. A uh, council president would appoint a committee to review that. Um, to uh, uh, City of Kent staff would be uh, helping to market that RFQ, and then uh, that panel would select a development team. Um, there's a lot more to say, perhaps, about the RFQ, but I'd like to first take questions, and then I can maybe elaborate from there. So with that, um, Kim, if you go just to the last slide, I'll take questions. All right, thank you so much, Bill. Um, I know this is information only, but I just kind of want to hear from council members. You know, what do you think of something like this? Are you in support of this? Any comments or any questions for Bill at this point? Council Member Larmer. Uh, thank you. Thank you for this presentation, Bill. I uh, appreciate the, the thought that's gone into it. Question about, I'm just wondering, you know, we, that how would this fit with our design standards since that we're talking about something that's bumping right up to Meeker? Would we be applying the Meeker and Meeker design standards? Yeah. And would there be an, and in that too, would there be an opportunity? I'm just wondering about like affordable housing above type of options. You know, we want to get people into our downtown core and, you know, like if we could find a way to have some affordable housing where like then we have people in our downtown core in the evenings to just for restaurants and bars and stuff. Um, um, is there a way to, to, to make this more, you know, kill two birds with one stone, I guess? Uh, I would say at this time, I, I understand my direction is trying to uh, draw employment into the downtown. Uh, as to the Meet Me on Meeker standards, absolutely, that is the objective or goal of, uh, of any development there would, of course, continue the promenade. Um, there's nothing I would say, um, especially when you're thinking of, a, let's say, a flex tech business park or any other corporate campus, um, nothing about our design standards are uh, ill-suited to that. Just bringing that up closer, those front door offices. Um, I think we've shown that in you know, lots of other examples, when, especially when we relax the zoning in DCE for manufacturing. Um, as far as to the more like direct mixing of housing on the site uh, with uh, industrial, um, I would say that industrial developers tend to be different developers or interested in different things than housing development. Um, but at the RFQ is not, um, it's not uh, written at this time to do, pursue anything other than its uh, workforce training or uh, employment goals as stated objectives of the city. Council Member Michelle. Thank you, Council President and Bill. When we talked about this a few months ago, you mentioned some ways that you were going to try to incorporate some green space and the trail. Can you talk about that? So at the RFQ point, it's really not a proposal. So we're not reacting to things that would say, this is exactly how uh, the trail could potentially flare out or you know have a plaza concept as it intersects with the uh, Meet Me on Meeker or other ideas of that, of that sort. We're just, asked, we're just looking for the best developer who is most experienced or she is most experienced at uh, doing public-private partnerships, because at that point, uh, you, you know, you could have a discussion creatively with them. Um, if we would have other objectives like that, uh, and uh, indeed in the RFQ, we would be talking about objectives like making sure that we uh, leveraged uh, 
off of the trail that runs right by the site. I'm sure they would see that or any developer would see that as a, a you know, plus or benefit to the development at that location. Um, you know, the, you know, we signal in the RFQ itself that that's something we'd want to uh, uh, encourage. Uh, I don't know if that would have a cost in terms of the price per, uh, the residual land value at the end. I guess there's just too many variables at this stage. Um, but I would say conceptually staff has for a very long time always felt that the interurban trail meeting weaker was a special moment and uh, sort of a gateway of sorts. And that would not be lost sight of in any proposed development. And again, this is an RFQ, request for qualifications, not a request for RFP, request for proposal. We're not asking for a developer to propose a development. We're leaving open-ended uh, so that there could be future co communication with council uh, city's vision, city's goals, city's objectives as a partner in any future proposal generated uh, with the developer. Uh, the point of bringing a developer, of course, uh, we don't have a lot of funds or resources at this point to um, develop concepts. Uh, we don't have a lot of money to work out infrastructure or do massing studies or do uh, endless iterations with architects of different formats or cost out the financing. We have none of that. but. Uh, just by uh, offering the land for a period of time as con under control, subject to a uh, potential tenanting or an option basically to, uh, to a developer, uh, we are incentivizing them to provide those things to realize our goals. And uh, that would be the approach here. Um, and I would say that, you know, uh, again, there's, there's a lot of other urban design objectives, obviously, when you have uh, this highly visible location in addition to sort of our economic development interests. Um, but being clear that there are uh, very clear opportunities at this moment and in this particular uh, jobs crisis to be thinking about that foremost. Thank you, Bill. So basically, you know, you're looking for support to be able to bring in this developer to help us work on this plan um, moving forward. So um, We're looking for a developer partner with the city to execute the city's vision. Yeah. Um, anybody else have any questions or comments? Um, I know Bill, you and I have talked about this. I completely support this. Um, very excited to be talking about some other things now moving forward. Um, you've done such a great job working for our business community and keeping us updated on the grants and all of those things that have been happening. Um, that being able to talk about something new is actually kind of exciting. So. Um, Councilmember Boyce, do you have your mic off? Yeah, just real quick. You know, Bill and I talked last week. This is something I strongly support. I mean, Bill and Michelle is doing a phenomenal job. So uh, this is the right thing to do. I just wanted to just go on the record and say it's something I support and it's the right direction that we should be heading. So thank you, Madam. Great. Thank you, Councilmember. Anybody else have any other comments or any questions for Bill? All right, thank you very much. I'm going to um, ask you to stay on, Bill, because it looks like- um, That's one I promise. <laughs> you've got a resolution on the Space Command headquarters. Um, talk to us a little bit about what that is. Sure, um, so Department of Commerce reached out to me a few weeks ago with an opportunity. Um, we have submitted, uh, Mayor Ralph uh, nominated the city of Kent uh, and Governor Inslee endorsed the city of Kent as potential home for the U.S. Space Command headquarters. Um, a few other cities in Washington, uh, Washington State have been uh, nominated and honored to uh, make through the first round. Tacoma, Lakewood, uh, not a surprise there for either of those communities uh, because of their proximity to Joint Base Lewis McCord. Uh, Everett, because of their Boeing uh, presence. Uh, Vancouver, um, which was a little bit of a surprise. Uh, uh, Spokane, uh, not a surprise there because of their uh, seeking uh, other uses for Fairchild Air Force Base. Um, but amongst all these cities, I, I believe the city of Kent, uh, amongst our peers, uh, is the best. Um, and then, really, uh, our competition as a state, our true competition, is Colorado Springs and uh, Huntsville, Alabama, sometimes called Rocket City, USA. Um, if you're testing search engine optimization, I uh, urge people to Google search uh, Alabama Space Mafia to learn about the congressional delegation in Alabama and their very... Um, very targeted uh, 
uh, interest in uh, bringing all things space related and especially federally funded things uh, from the congressional delegation into their district. So they'll, they'll be a contender. Uh, they did win Project Eagle for uh, some of the manufacturing that is done on Blue Origin engine, uh, um, Blue Origin, um, Blue Origin rocket. Sorry, uh, there's 20 other six other states we're competing with. Um, Joint Base Lewis McCord is, of course, a key criteria. We are uh, we had to be 25 miles distance from a major military installation, and we are 25 miles distance from Joint Base Lewis McCord. They are also working with us at, at this time to help uh, fulfill the questionnaire. Uh, other things that we had to get through in the first round was our community livability index score to the AARP um, and uh, the cost of living in our area. Next slide, please. So uh, we've received the questionnaire now and we're working with both the State Department of Commerce and Greater Seattle Partners in putting together uh, an application that would be competitive. Um, these are the big buckets. There's a lot of sub questions and it's a pretty thick packet we'll be working through between now and the deadline of August 30th, we've been invited to submit. Um, but basically, how does our location contribute to the mission of the United States Space Command? How does it add capacity? Uh, what is the nature of the community? Do we value and support our veterans? And uh, uh, are there any um, savings to the United States taxpayer uh, by reduced cost of the Department of Defense by uh, placing a facility in Kent? I also want to just make a quick distinction for, you know, it's kind of interesting for those who might be uh, interested. Uh, United States Space Command uh, was actually originally created in 1985 and then retired after the September 11th attacks in 2002 and consolidated into the other military branches. It has been restored now in 2019. It is not Space Force. It is uh, actually uh, responsible for the operational planning of uh, U.S. forces in the theater of war of outer space. Next slide, please. Um, so why Kent? Uh, why would we be interested from an economic development standpoint? Well, of course, there would be massively uh, positive economic impacts with 1,000 plus federal jobs. Uh, it would bestow prestige for the region's space cluster, which is why there is incredibly heated competition between the states of Alabama, Florida, Texas, and Colorado for this location. And uh, uh, direct federal investment in their expanding to local economy. While I don't have a measure as this opportunity has come to me in the last few weeks, uh, I would say it would be in the hundreds of millions. Uh, the facility itself, of course, would be about uh, close to a million square feet. So there's a lot of direct investment just creating the uh, facility. Next slide, please. So the Kent Space Valley, as we've been talking about and all the work that uh, uh, Michelle's been doing, you can see in the uh, branding here around the Kent Valley Economic Development, um, there's a beautiful headquarters of the Blue Origin, but also we're home to Boeing Space. We're also home to companies like uh, Shape Technologies that provide the automated uh, robotic uh, manufacturing solutions for SpaceX. Um, there's a company in the city of Kent known as Viking Metals, who is working on the 42,000 satellites that are being launched by SpaceX to create internet in the outer space. Um, there's a whole supply chain here. Uh, I've seen at one particular Kent Aerospace manufacturer nose cones for the SpaceX rocket uh, being produced. So we have a very broad case uh, to make. And I would say that we have the military base, we have the brain power, we have the, uh, uh, the builders of the gear that Space Force needs and all that technical uh, wizardry has been, continues to be in the Kent Valley. Uh, and I think we would confer benefits on national security if uh, we were so chosen to be U.S. Space Command uh, headquarters. So we are also having the real estate uh, uh, space uh, to accommodate and be a host. So we have prepared a resolution uh, to share with council this evening um, as we seek to um, put our best foot forward and welcome uh, U.S. Space Command uh, and put and describe all the great advantages that we could confer uh, to uh, U.S. Space Command headquarters here in the Kent Valley, or as I'm teasing you with, the Kent Space Valley. Questions? Thank you, Bill. Questions from Councilmember Larmer. Thank you, Council President. So, Bill, um, I looked, I was, I had to do some research because, and thank you for clarifying that it's not Space Force, that was confusing me, but when I was doing the research, it looked like um, so Colorado Springs, mm -hmm. I found a bunch of newspaper clippings that were saying that it's their home for six years. So is this, are we talking about, are they reaching out now because this is something that they want to move forward with in 2026? 
I was just I was confused by that because there was clearly so the Air Force. Is, yeah, no. Yeah, no, they've been to Colorado Springs, and Colorado Springs is also the home of uh, the largest private space industry event, not coincidentally, also where the federal government has a lot of its installations and uh, generals, <clears throat> and they can socialize. Uh, but I would say that uh, uh, when it comes to um, what we're pursuing right now, uh, the Air Force is vetting a large number of communities uh, all across the country, making uh, checking them against criteria uh, compiling them, and then the Air Force will make a recommendation to the Commander in Chief, who will make that decision in 2021. Uh, I don't have much more details to when it would actually build or not build, because they're also looking at a variety of other options like leasing existing buildings or facilities. It's very much wide open at this stage. Okay. Well, I love the idea of a thousand jobs in Canada, so that's great. Thank yeah. you. You're welcome. And uh, Colorado Springs is. Um, uh, considered the uh, leading horse in the race. Council member Fincher. I think we need to unmute council member Fincher. Thank you, Bill. So I know that we have a good deal of aerospace here. We're one of the aerospace leaders, but does that also include Everett and Lakewood? Do they have a good deal of aerospace there? I know they have Boeing, but outside of that. Uh, I don't think anyone has the diversity of manufacturing and know-how that we do, and especially in space. We have uh, within the space subsector of aerospace, uh, we have the deepest bench. We have the uh, largest percentage of uh, workers. Um, we have uh, the longest legacy and heritage. Um, we are by far and away with more than half of all the outer space jobs in the state of Washington, um, the best. Um, we're having a friendly competition online with my counterparts in the city of Everett and Tacoma, who's going to buy who Tang and who's going to buy who uh, uh, space ice cream, uh, depending on the outcome of all this. Uh, we are being collaborative in those areas at which we're collaborative, but we're also um, being jealous on behalf of our own cities and, and describing our best case for it. And uh, I really do that in the state of Washington, um, no one would have a better claim than us based on our uh, technical know-how. Good, thank you. All right, any other questions or comments for Bill on this? So as a formality, we do, in order for the government to select Kent to um, host this permanent headquarters, we do have to adopt a resolution so if there are no objections, we will go ahead and move this to the consent calendar. All right, great job, Bill. Thank you. All right, next up, I would like to welcome our employee of the month for August. Congratulations, Michelle Ferguson. Um, information only on the June financial report to begin with. Thank you. Hi, good evening, council members. Thank you for that. Um, I will be presenting the June 2020 monthly financial report. Um, I know the our council meeting workshop yesterday, we talked about some of the July numbers. So this is going to be a little bit um, of a repeat of what we already talked about last night, but we'll give you, I'll give you a little bit of more details of kind of where the June numbers kind of shook out and some more detailed information around that. Okay, we can start with the next slide. Um, next. Okay, so the general fund revenues, we have received uh, 52.5 million in revenues through June. Revenues through June of 2019 were 55.5 million, which is about a $3 million uh, difference. But in last month's May report, there was a $4.5 million variance. Um, we have received the, the property taxes that we were missing from King County, and that has helped um, kind of reduce that variance. But the revenues are primarily still down in licenses and permits, intergovernmental charges for services and miscellaneous revenues. And we'll talk about those in the next two slides. So through June, the property tax was is now coming in just slightly over budget. So King County extended that first half of the 2020 property tax deadline to June 1st, which caused that temporary reduction in revenues that you saw in last month's report. Um, it's corrected itself and the next big payment we will be expecting in October if King County doesn't extend those payments, which hopefully they won't. 
Um, sales tax is about 340,000 above the June 2019 year to date revenues. Um, and part of the reason for that is that we did, if council remembers, we in the mid biennium adjustment, we shifted the property tax. It was a 77.7 .7 split between um, going to the general fund and the 20 2.3% was going to capital resources fund. Um, now it's an 80-20 split. And so that's why it's a little bit higher. We're not actually seeing more sales tax right now. It's just the shift in it. Uh, if you go to the next slide, you'll see the utility tax is still coming in um, right at budget and just slightly above. It's 476,000 over the 2019 year to date revenues. Uh, BNO tax is 726,000 over the 2019 year to date revenues. And this increase in BNO revenues is due to the increase in square footage rates. Other revenues on that bottom graph um, include licenses and permits, intergovernmental revenues, charges for services, fines and forfeitures, and miscellaneous revenues. The licenses and permits are down 536,000 from the same time last year. Intergovernmental revenues are down nearly $2.2 million from last year, which is mostly due to the revenues from shifting from the general fund for SST to the capital resources fund. Charges for services are down um, a little over $1.8 million, which is a combination of charges for services from parks, ECD, and fire, as well as a small amount from court. Fines and forfeitures are down 150,000 from the same time last year and miscellaneous revenues are down 367,000. Um, on the last report, uh, miscellaneous revenues were down 700,000, um, but because we've been giving in more interest income, we've been able to reduce that variance. So here we'll compare the year to year monthly comparison, um, mostly looking at expenditures. So general fund expenditures are 2.7 million over what they were in 2019. Um, as you can see, most of the departments are coming in under budget and with half the year gone, you would expect to see about 50% of the budget being expended. But as you can see, it's only 42%. And this is mostly due to the central cost allocation plan and the COVID reductions. So IT and public works are highlighted again, same as last time to point out that those are those annexation expenses those had their last expenses entered in them for June, so we won't see those going up at all. Um, you can see that they're a little bit over budget, but there's an offsetting revenue that balances those. So even though the expenses is higher, the revenues are higher. So it's not like the general fund is having to cover more of those expenses. So highlighted in that bluish kind of purpley color, um, there is a really high variance from this time last year as well as in 18, and that is because there's been some large transfers out to the BO projects. Those are budgeted and we've just, they've needed their money sooner than they do normally at this time. So it just looks a little off, but as you can see, the percent of budget is still only at 29.3. 29 so everything is fine there. So we can go and compare some of the other revenue funds, just some ones that pop out, you know, most of them are doing fine, but if you look at the capital resources fund, um, there's a negative variance for expenditures, and that's because some of the projects that are in the capital resources funds, we haven't needed to transfer those funds to those specific projects. Um, normally, we wait until the project needs it, and because, you know, there was that kind of that pause in construction activity, some of those projects are a little bit behind. So as the year goes on, we'll see that number grow and kind of catch up where it has been in years past. So the show we're operating has a 70% variance from last year um, and even more from the year before. So this is partially due to an accounting entry. So usually on a monthly basis, we tie our books to showers. So um, as their cash goes up, we enter a negative expense. And as their cash balance goes down, we enter a positive expense. So we're not actually giving shower any more money. Um, we just are doing this entry to reflect how shower is spending their money. In next month's report, um, you'll see that expense go slightly down. So it's just a, kind of a floating target as the months go by. Um, in the next page, the solid waste utility, its expenditures are up um, 
slightly from the prior two years. And that is because during the COVID reductions, uh, streets decided to move one person that was in the street fund into the solid waste utility fund. And you'll see that part of the, as part of the budget change that we'll talk about in the Q2 adjustments. And then property insurance is the only one kind of showing variance on that last page. Um, it's the same as it has been um, last month and the year before, uh, the month before it's uh, just because there was um, a construction cost in 2019 and related to the Lake Meridian bathrooms and the damage done to them. So, but if you're looking at 2019 to 2020, um, there is not really a variance. Is there any questions? Questions for Michelle on this report. Councilmember Thomas, do you have your mic? Do you have a question? I did. Go ahead. Is that for me? Yep, Council Member Thomas, go ahead. Oh, thank you. I didn't hear my name. Oh, so can you go back to page, I think, 13 under show where I wanted to ask a question. Let's see. So the revenues for 2018, going to 2019, then 2020, between 19 and 20, uh, those years, there's not a whole lot of difference in the revenues. It's just expenditures are really high. Yes. So, I mean, that partially has to do with the, you know, them having to shut down and use more expenditures than they would have expected at this point in time of the year. Yeah, but it wouldn't be any different this year, would it, than last year's for the same basic of the utilities or whatever? Um, if it's okay, I'd like to chime in. This is Paula Painter, Finance Director. Hi, Paula. Hello. Hey, so with the Showware Center, this is another one of these things where these are book entries. And if you stop and think about what's going on with the Showware Center, they are closed. So what right. ends up happening is they're really not, for the last several months, they have not um, had an opportunity to bring in revenue. Um, but what happens is that means that as costs go out, they're spending down more of their cash. So what you're looking at, that $903,000 oh, is a reflection oh. of how much cash that they're actually having to spend down. Okay. What I can say in the July report, if I remember correctly, um, they're actually going to, this expense of 903 is going to be less than that. It's probably, I don't know if it's seven or 800,000, but it's a number that is less than 900,000. So what you're going to see is that number moves because we just adjust their expense to match their cash balance. It's not actual expenditure per se. This I is see just that. How we put our books in line with one another. Gotcha. Thank you. You're very welcome. Sorry to interrupt, Michelle. Oh, no. Thank you for explaining it. Thanks, everyone. Any other questions on the financial report? All right, Michelle, I don't see anyone with their mic off. So on to the consolidated budget adjustment ordinance. All right, so this is a consolidating budget adjustment ordinance for adjustments that happened between April 1st and June 30th of 2020. So we're requiring authorization to approve the technical gross budget adjustment of $19,253,712. Adjustments totaling $5,719,459 have been previously approved by council and um, include 1.5 million-ish in grants, which are 970,000 for the Department of Commerce grant for the YMCA project, 400,000 from King County Flood Control District grant for the Lower Russell Road levy, $80,000 in criminal justice JAG grants, $43,000 for a true up of 2019 CDBG grants, and $17,000 in other grants, um, including a Washington Public Defense grant, um, police mini grant, and a drainage grant. So then there were also $3,190,400 in adjustments related to the HCMA project. So the HCMA project didn't actually get a $3 million budget adjustment, but that's because of how we have to kind of do the double entry, we have to record the expense 
transfer and then plus the expense in the project, it inflates that number. So there was 1.45 million in transfers, um, 617 from the capital resources fund and then 833,000 from the IT operating fund, the HMA. And then for use of the, in the actual project, there was 1.7 million dollars, including the IT operating fund balance transfer of the 833 and the capital resources fund balance transfer of the 617, as well as from IT tech plans, they transferred in $290,000. So there's a total of $968,360 in carry forward budgets for fleet and solid waste. So $860,000 were for fleet vehicles that were still on order at the end of 2019, which includes four dump trucks and 108,000 in recycling grants for waste reduction, recycling, local hazard waste management program and local, local solid waste financial assistance grants. And those grants run on a fiscal year instead of a calendar year. So those are carried over every year. There was also 50,000 in COVID-19 budget increase for the lodging tax fund for business recovery efforts. And the re remaining adjustments total $13,534,253 that has not been previously approved by council. So the bulk of this is gonna be um, $9.25 million for the use of funding sources for the YMCA. So the YMCA basically gave us $8.9 million and then we have to budget the expense to give them the money back. It's an accounting entry, so it looks really huge, but we're not actually spending the city money of $9 million. So also included in that are the trench agreement utility MOU for 196,000, fee and lieu funds, 85,000, levy funds of 50,000, public art program, 25,000, and then small 10,000 from a few other sources. The lease was just paid at the end of July and there will be one last budget change related to the YMCA that will be completed in August that will balance the project. There was a $4.2 million in street project funding. And again, this is one of those double entry ones, so it wasn't as much. It includes $2.6 million for the South 212th and $699,000 for the 76th Avenue road raising that was transferred from unallocated BNO funds. And then $670,000 for the 4th and Willis roundabout. The 335 was from interest income, and then we also budgeting the expense and then 250,000 for the Meeker Street frontage that came from golf funds and 27,000 to true up a few of the unallocated projects. There was, so to offset that, there was a decrease of basically $2.6 million for the reallocating of budgets from unallocated DNO to the South 212 and the 76 road raising that we just, that I just mentioned. There was $2 million in net fund increases due to the COVID-19 reduction exercise. These increases include transfers to the general fund from the health and wellness fund of a million dollars, um, 523,000 from the school zone camera funds to the general fund and shifting of 232,000 in salaries and benefits from the general fund to the health and wellness fund, as well as 127,000 from the street fund to the solid waste and drainage funds for salaries and benefits. The net decreases have not been completed yet because of some of the payouts that had to do with those reductions and those you'll be seeing in the Q3 budget adjustment. There was also $700,000 transferred from the street life cycles fund balance to the street capital projects for South 212, 122,000 for COVID-19 JAG grant for the police related COVID expenses. There was a decrease of $200,000 for the GIS budget and allocations related to the GIS reorganization and 25,000 in other small line items from water utility funds and decreasing fundings for Comer IT projects. Is there any questions? Thank you so much for all that information, Michelle. Are there any questions about this adjustment? All right, I'm not seeing any hands raised. So if there's no objection, we'll move this ordinance to the consent calendar to approve the consolidating budget adjustments between April 1st and June 30th. All right, thank you so much, Michelle. Thank you. All right, up next on the agenda, we have payment of bills, which we will move that to the consent calendar. 
And then I would like to welcome Soman Talat to talk about the agreement for consultant services with North Harris Computer Corporation. Thank you, Council President. <laughs> Greetings, Council Members, Mayor, and everyone else in virtual attendance this evening. I am Soman Pallet, the Technology Innovation Manager. I oversee three areas of IT, custom applications development, business system support, and the newly added enterprise GIS. Uh, the motion before you is to approve entering into a new Master Professional Services Agreement, an MPSA, with Harris Computer Corp, which will allow for additional integrations development, as well as updating existing integrations as needed between INOVA, the point of sale solution, and other city business systems. The MPSA contains two schedules, A1 and A2, which are new integrations between INOVA and the city's in-house custom developed business license solution and also between INOVA and AMANDA, the city's new permit solution. Both of these business functions currently reside within the Kiva system. A bit of history on INOVA and system innovators. INOVA is the city's point of sale solution that replaced class for all but parks and municipal court. The system went live last December in 2019. System Innovators is the development and implementation arm of Harris that designs, builds, and provides ongoing support for all of their integrations between INOVA and other city systems. This capability and relationship were among the key uh, factors that we looked at and why we selected INOVA as the product. Today, INOVA has real-time integrations in place with DataNow, our utility building solution, a live integration with our in-house developed online utility billing payment portal, and also our in-house developed BNO solution. INOVA also has a file-based loose integration with Kiva. As you know, Kiva is way too old to actually integrate anything with. Uh, so currently these together come to a 27,000 a year uh, renewal that we are paying. Um, with schedules A1 and A2, these will allow us to add the missing real-time integrations between INOVA and the two new systems that are going in place to replace Kiva. Because there are two separate systems being integrated, this work will be carried out as two separate integration projects, one for finance for the business license and one for ECD for Amanda. The total cost of this work, which also includes the first year's support and maintenance, is roughly $132,000 all of which is within available funds from the software life cycle, sorry, software life cycle reserves for both finance and ECD. This work is just another step in a series of changes undertaken in replacing several of the legacy business systems that we started in this biennium. Because of the complexities surrounding this space of solutions, I have provided a critical path business systems diagram for you to look at. Uh, that can probably explain a little bit more, at least pictorially, where we are. Um, there are a lot of systems in play. There are seven independent but interconnected uh, projects. Some of them have been completed and some are still in process. So this will actually, uh, this um, integration for INOVA, uh, for Amanda and also business license are related as well because they are going to be integrating with each other down the road as well. The three red lines on the diagram are what we're basically trying to do in this, uh, this change with these schedules. So with that, I have, uh, uh, I'll be happy to answer any questions you may have on either. Sorry. All right, any questions or comments about this agreement? All right, so if there are no objections, we will move this to the consent calendar. All right, thank you so much. Thank you. Moving on, I'm going to welcome Nate Harper to talk about a consultant service agreement with Studio Mang Strazara. Welcome. Uh, yeah, good, good evening, Council President, Mayor, and members of the Council. I am Nate Harper, Capital Projects Manager for the Facilities Division, and we have a project that we are undertaking involving the Police Department, in which we'll be adding around 500 square feet to the footprint of the building. And um, let's see, we're going to be um, 
expanding the existing lunchroom, creating an outdoor space outside of the newly constructed lunchroom, modifying the existing locker room to create a training space and make modifications to the existing second floor storage room for new locker space. Um, we conducted RFP process back in early January for the architectural services for this project. Uh, we were fortunate to receive seven proposals back and interviewed our top three picks. From there, we fully vetted and voted by committee to select Studio Mangstra Zara for this project. The, the Studio Mangstra Zara provided a proposal in the amount of $192,974 for the architectural services in the design and production of construction documents required for this project. We feel that Studio Mangstra Zara um, is the best candidate for this, and we recommend moving forward with them on this project. And I, with that, I can take any questions regarding the project. Thank you. Any questions or comments about this? So I know this is just for, this is working on for the, the design. Okay. Correct. So I mean, looking down the road, um, kind of what's the timeline do you think that all of this would eventually get completed? Um, we're looking after the first of the year that we would actually be going into the bidding process. From there, um, that process usually takes up to 90 days. Um, and if we were to move forward with the contractor at that point, it would be middle of next year before we get going on it. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Are there any objections to moving forward, um, moving this to the consent calendar um, to have the mayor sign this agreement? All right. Looks like you are good to move forward. Thank you so much. Thank you. And next, we're going to welcome Chris Wadsworth to talk about an ordinance uh, 4365. Welcome. Fourteen oh nine. Oh, sorry. Did did everybody get that first part? I, my phone just said I was unmuted. Welcome, Chris. Go ahead and start over. That would be great. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. It's been a delay there. Um, so good afternoon. Thank you, President Troutner, members of the council, and Mayor Ralph. Uh, my name is Chris Wadsworth, floodplain administrator for the city of Kent. And today I'd like to run through a small change to Kent City Code Chapter 1409. Uh, and if it seems like I just brought a similar code change to council last month, you are correct. And I'll explain that as we proceed. So as with all things related to Code Chapter 1409, which is Kent's flood hazard regulations, uh, this is driven by programmatic requirements at the federal level. Um, in July, I brought an ordinance to completely repeal and replace Code Chapter 1409 to Kent City Council at a public hearing where it was voted on and approved. The day after the public hearing, I sent the signed ordinance to FEMA uh, who reviewed it and noted that they had missed a portion of our code during their initial review back in March of 2020. Uh, so the portion that they missed is Kent City Code item 1409-150C. And FEMA has stated that it must be removed from Kent City Code if the city is to remain in compliance with the National Flood Insurance Program. So this, this code item covers only a very specific type of work. Uh, it allows for a small amount of water elevation rise in floodways and only applies to fish habitat enhancement projects that contain no other aspects. Uh, so for instance, a levee project that includes fish habitat enhancement does not qualify since it also contains a flood protection component. Uh, now private developers are unlikely to ever do this type of work. Uh, and the only agencies that are likely to do this type of work in Kent uh, are the City of Kent Public Works Department, King County, and the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. So, so FEMA conducts periodic audits uh, known as community assistance visits, uh, and due to a recent change in how they administer these audits, 
FEMA is already administering the National Flood Insurance Program as if this code item was not present in Kent City Code. Uh, the removal of the code item will not create any new development limitations, and locally there will be no functional difference in how Kent staff administers the code or issues permits. Um, and then just to reiterate, the code item must be removed in order for Kent to remain as a participating community in the National Flood Insurance Program. Uh, and as such, Kent staff recommends removal of the Kent City Code item 1409-150C. And uh, yeah, thank you for your time. Great, thank you. Um, makes sense to me. Um, how about any comments or questions from my council members? Any objections to moving this forward to the consent calendar? All right, great, thank you for joining us. Thank you very much. All right, next I'm going to welcome Brian Levenhagen to talk about conversion for the YMC replacement property. Welcome. Thank you, uh, Council President Troutner, and uh, good evening, uh, Council and Mayor and staff. Today or tonight, I'm going to bring to you another step in the process of completing the Morrill Meadows Park YMCA uh, project. Um, quickly, a, a brief kind of recap of, of um, where we're at. If you remember that when we embarked on the YMCA project, um, the existing Morrill Meadows Park and Eastville Park sites had a number of um, RCO uh, grant restrictions on them, which required us to go through a, a conversion process for any indoor recreation space or supporting amenities for that space. Uh, next, slide, next slide, please. So here on, on this uh, picture, you can see outlined in red is the, the portion of the property that we had to convert for through the RCOs process. Uh, it's about 3.42 acres. Um, and it was the, the portion of that property that we had to convert for is the, is the land value of that property. Next slide, please. So if you remember way back in 2018, we acquired the ransom property, um, be part of the Mill Creek Earthworks Park assemblage in order to fulfill a portion of the RCO grant conversion requirements for the project. Um, the other piece of land that was acquired to fulfill part of that was the Lenoy property. Um, and then the development conversion will be um, completed once we um, finish construction of the new Van Dorn's Landing Park as part of the Lower Russell Road levy project. So tonight um, I am seeking uh, authorization for the mayor to sign the RCO deed of right to use uh, land for public outdoor recreation purposes uh, that will be placed over the ransom property to satisfy the conversion for the Moro Meadows YMCA project. So with that, I'll answer any questions if there are any. Thanks, Brian. I know we've talked about this in the past. So any questions for Brian? Yes, I do. House Member Thomas, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, so is that three acres there on the corner of 104th and 267? Is that the one with the gazebo and all that on it? No, it's not. It's, it's a little um, f further to the west from there. But it's not the ransom property. Uh, well, it, was, it is what, it's what we refer to as the ransom property. It's the, the one outlined in, in brown there on, on the map. Yeah, no, I understand that. The three acres, who owns that then? Oh, sorry. So it just says three acres. It just says said the ransom property is three acres. So um, I'm not, they, I know that property that you're referencing was sold a few years ago. I'm not sure who knew that, who the new owner Right, was. right. Uh, yeah. Okay. So that was, so that's one of the gazebo of yeah, the yeah. wedding. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thanks. Thanks, Council Member. Any other questions or comments? All right. And Brian kind of read bits and pieces of that motion. It's a very long motion in your packet, but if there are no objections, we will move this forward for the conversion for the YMCA replacement property to approve this on the consent calendar. And I'm not seeing any objections, so um, we will move on to the next presentation. Thank you, Brian. Thank you. And next, I'm going to welcome Stephen Lincoln. Uh, good evening. Am I coming in all right? You are great. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. In that case, uh, Council President Troutner, Mayor Ralph, members of the committee, good evening. My name is Stephen Lincoln. I'm an engineer with the Department of Public Works Environmental Engineering Design Group. 
I have presented to this committee before, but uh, this is the first time I am uh, presenting via a uh, telepresence application such as Zoom. So I apologize in advance for any hiccups that may occur during the presentation. Uh, tonight, I'm here to present a design contract with Jacob, uh, Jacobs Engineering for the uh, mechanical, electrical, architectural, and structural elements of the Washington Avenue Pump Station Relocation Project. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you, Kim. Uh, the existing Washington Avenue pump station, uh, shown uh, shaded in blue on uh, this slide, is uh, located north of the Green River Trail, uh, just to the west of Washington Avenue South. Uh, this pump station was originally designed in 2001 to uh, provide flood relief to about 30 acres of land uh, around Washington Avenue north of the pump station. Uh, this pump station at the time of its design had a capacity of, uh, ha and still does have a capacity of six cubic feet per second and is uh, operated by basic water level sensitive switches. Uh, shown on the right of the slide is a photograph of the existing pump station taken from a street view image. The, uh, current, it's, currently it's configured with a uh, single pump and uh, a ba a, uh, has no backup power supply. Uh, now, looking at uh, readings we we had from the pump station during the high uh, the high water event we had in early February, uh, shows that this pump station was operate in operation continuously for just over sixty hours during the uh, the high when the Green River was at its highest level. Uh, because of this, uh, our project uh, proposes not merely to relocate the pump station, but to uh, make improvements to it as well. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, once relocated, uh, we intend to uh, provi uh, provide upgrades, uh, such as increasing the pump station service area to take in the LA Fitness and Holmes Electric sites uh, immediately across the street from its new relocated location, as well as from uh, the neighborhoods along 3rd Avenue and 5th Avenue east of State Route 167. Uh, Re uh, resulting also in increasing the pump station's capacity from six cubic feet per second up to 25 cubic feet per second. Uh, the pump station will also be improved by adding a second pump to allow alternating operation of the pump station, which will uh, both increase the pump station's lifespan, uh, but also uh, allow the pump station to retain some functionality if one pump were to, for some reason or another, develop a mechanical fault and require repair at a time when the pump station is required to be in operation. Uh, additionally, another feature we'll be adding to the improved pump station is a backup power generator uh, to ensure against the possibility of a power outage occurring during a time when the pump station is required is needed to provide flood, uh, flood reduction. Uh, as a final upgrade, we will also be uh, adding uh, new and improved controls and telemetry systems to the pump station to allow remote operation from the city's operations building at James Street. Uh, as a result of all of these improvements together, the new, the relocated and improved uh, pump station will be much more in line with the city's new pump station at James Street, shown at the photograph on the uh, on the right of this slide. Uh, now, to allow this project to continue forward, uh, we recommend that the committee of the whole recommend to the city council to authorize the mayor to sign an agreement with Jacobs Engineering to provide these designs and specifications for the mechanical, electrical, architectural, and structural elements of the improved and relocated pump station. Uh, I thank you for your consideration this evening and for your continuing support for our projects. Thank you so much for that presentation. And just to clarify, money from this is budgeted out of the drainage utility fund, correct? Uh, that is correct. Great. Council Member Fincher, comment or question? Thank you, uh, both. Uh, because going from 6 to 25 CFS is pretty uh, pretty dramatic. But I was wondering, do we have other pump stations that do not have a backup power so source? And if so, how many? Uh, I, I believe at this time, I'd have to confirm it with operations, but uh, right now I believe that James Street has a backup power supply. The new GRNRA South Pump Station has a backup power supply. I believe there is a backup power supply at the Foster Park pump station. There is not a backup power supply currently at the uh, Washington Avenue pump station. I would have to check to see if we have one or not at the Third Avenue pump station near the Milwaukee two levy improvements. Uh, I believe uh, my uh, 
my uh, group manager, Mike, is uh, listening in on the speeding. Mike, do, uh, do you know of any other pump stations that we are uh, that we don't have a backup power supply on? Uh, I, I I don't know them, um, the whole list of them, but I know the older pump stations uh, would tend to be lacking the the backup power supply. The newer pump stations that we put in, uh, we do install that as more of a, a, a regular practice. Uh, just because usually when the power goes out is uh, there's a good tendency that there's a storm or something go going on and that's when you really need the pump station to be working. But we can okay. certainly look up the list to get details on that. Thank you. I'll wait for that list. Thank you very much. Thank you, Council Member. Any other comments or questions? All right, so everyone heard the motion. Any objections to Moving this forward to consent calendar for consultant service agreement with Jacobs Engineering Group. All right, I'm not seeing any. So thank you very much for joining us. No problem. And now I'm going to turn it over to April Dachance. We have three more presentations. Each one requires um, approval. So we will take it one at a time. Go ahead, April. Good evening. Thank you for having me. It is going to be uh, just myself, April Delshamps, the Senior Transportation Planner and Public Works. Emily Ellis Gearhart with Farron Pierce was not able to attend tonight. So good evening. Tonight I will be providing an update on the TMP project quarter list for public outreach and requesting approval to proceed with the next phase of public outreach. Next slide, please. First, I want to give a quick project update. Next slide, please. Over the last three weeks, staff and the consultant have been working in four key areas. First, we have been busy updating the refined project quarter list to incorporate comments heard at the July 21st City Council workshop. Second, we have been focusing on the next phase of public outreach. We met with the city's communications team, developed a public outreach strategy, and scheduled presentations to the city's boards. Third, staff from Economic and Community Development, Parks and Public Works began the review process for the TMP chapters. And fourth, we are developing the transportation impact fee comparison and the financial plan for the next city council update on September 15th. Next slide, please. The project quarters list presented at the July 21st workshop has been reviewed and updated to both include your feedback and to organize for the public outreach efforts. At this point, staff would like to request your approval to proceed to the public outreach with this updated refined project quarter list. Next slide. Staff organized the updated refined quarter list into 33 quarters based on project location. One note, three of the quarters since we've submitted this list are gonna to need to be split further in order to be used on the web map. The project, the number of projects on Meeker, James Street and South Hill Greenways is higher than the other corridors and is unable to go on the web map as is. Next slide, please. There are eight project corridors in downtown. These include the Meeker Street and James Street that were referenced earlier. Next slide, please. There are six project corridors in the Manufacturing Industrial Center. Next slide. In Midway, there are four projects. Next slide. In Northeast Hill, there are six, seven project quarters. And finally, next slide, please. There are eight project quarters in the Southeast Hill. One note on this slide, Southeast Hill 8 was added based on feedback received at the July 21st City Council workshop. And I'm gonna pause here really quickly um, since I went through that quickly and just make sure there was no questions on the project quarter list that was included in, as an exhibit. Thank you, April. Anything? All right, hearing no questions. Next up, staff and the consultants have spent the last three weeks brainstorming the public outreach strategy and the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. Public outreach combined with funding constraints and opportunities is the last major task before developing the draft prioritized project list for the TMP. Next slide, please. Staff and consultants spent time defining the objective for this outreach effort. At the core of the effort is the priority to engage with residents, especially underserved communities, and business in Kent to hear their feedback on the project quarters list. Fundamentally, we hope to understand what project quarters are most important and what did we miss. 
staff identified flexibility and availability as key features. Due to the COVID pandemic, we need to be available and flexible in promoting the outreach effort using all available mediums and opportunities. Next slide, please. The overall strategies fall in five areas, the website, locations, online, virtual, and print. The website will have the web map and survey, as well as be the clearinghouse of materials like the fact sheet and common questions and answers. Location strategies focus on posting information on the outreach effort at places that people gather in Kent. For online strategies, I am coordinating with the communications department. Virtual strategies focus on participating in as many events and meetings as possible to promote the outreach effort. And finally, for print strategies, I'm coordinating with the multimedia department to develop materials for this effort. Next slide, please. Connecting with and seeking feedback from underserved communities is a priority for this outreach effort. Some of the strategies include connecting with groups that have already participated in earlier outreach efforts, considering extra efforts on social media to target members of underserved communities, potentially interviewing community advocates, exploring the possibility of focus groups with members of underserved communities, and exploring opportunities to distribute materials in coordination with other efforts such as food drives. Next slide, please. In addition, staff will be giving presentations and facilitating workshops with the Land Use and Planning Board, the Kent Bicycle Advisory Board, and the Transportation Advisory Board. Staff are also developing a packet for the Cultural Community Board members and exploring interviewing each of the members. Next slide, please. The next steps of the Transportation Master Plan focus on many of the same tasks detailed under the project update. Prior to starting, starting public outreach, staff and the consultants are going to be finalizing print and online materials, setting up the processes to post posters at various locations, developing a community events and meeting list, contacting community advocates, and develop materials for presentations and workshops. The public outreach effort is tentatively scheduled to start late next week and run two to three weeks. Staff are being flexible to ensure that there is an opportunity for all residents and businesses to provide feedback. Feedback received will be used to start developing the prioritized project list. A parallel effort is the TMP financial plan and the transportation impact fee comparison. The financial plan will shape the prioritized project list by defining the actual budget for capital projects. And finally, efforts are ongoing to draft and review the chapters that will become the TMP document. And that is all I have, and I have open for any questions. Great, thank you. I appreciate you taking all the comments into consideration. Anybody have any questions or comments about this public outreach? All right, I'm not seeing any hands raised or mics on. So is everyone okay with moving this forward for the consent calendar, and this would be um, for the public outreach uh, to provide that list. All right. Thank you, April. Let's go ahead and move on to the next presentation. So it is my pleasure to present this after two years of effort. Tonight, I want to talk about two agreements related to the 2018 Washington, Washington State Department of Transportation Regional Mobility Grant Program Award. Next slide, please. The 2018 Washington WashDOT Regional Mobility Grant Program Award was for $8 million for preliminary engineering and construction for bus stops and access to transit facilities for Rapid Ride I. King County Metro is a partner on this grant and we're providing the local match of $2.68 million. Next slide, please. The project is for rapid ride eye shelters, including the sitting area, trash receptacle, ADA landing pads, and shelter and area lighting, for onboard, offboard fare payment system, for real-time information signs and bike racks where applicable, and for sidewalk improvements and enhanced pedestrian crossings within a half a mile of any given stop. Next slide, please. Before you today are two agreements. The first is with WashDOT to accept the $8 million grant, and the second was with Metro to subcontract to design and build the project. Next slide, please. Currently, Rapid Ride I is approaching 30% design. 
Construction on this project, as well as the Greater Rapid Ride Eye project, is expected to begin in early 2022 and be complete in the second quarter of 2023. The motions were included in your packet, as well as some additional details. And that is, and I'm ready for questions. All right. Thank you. Of course, we lo always love to get grant money. Any questions for April? And this is for both of the motions, if you're, is that correct, April? That is correct. I should have stated that at the beginning. Um, all right. So I'm not seeing any hands raised. So this would be um, one motion is for the 2018 Regional Mobility Grant King County Metro Transit Department Agreement. And then the next one is for the 2018 Regional Mobility Grant WashDOT Agreement. So any objections to moving those both forward to the consent calendar? All right, thank you so much for all of those presentations, April, and for joining us. Thank you. And that brings us to the end of our meeting. Lots of things that we took care of this evening. So thank you to my council members for all of your input and for everyone that joined us. Thank you so much and have a good evening. We are adjourned.